Never in human history has intelligence been more crucial for our survival, but the best way to increase our intelligence isn't with more facts and information. Instead, it's by building our critical thinking skills. In this video, I'm going to draw upon my 11 years of experience as an internationally published researcher in the behavioral sciences to lay out four life-changing steps we can use to master critical thinking and avoid becoming a pawn in someone else's game. And the first step in this process is to determine whether the facts or information we've been presented with are descriptive or evaluative. Understanding this distinction is the most crucial first step we need to take when evaluating any new information, ideas, or claims we come across, because the misuse of this distinction is one of the main ways marketers, politicians, and others try to control our behavior. You see, descriptive statements contain no value judgments. I'm reading a book right now. A coin flip is heads 50% of the time. It's gonna rain tomorrow. We can easily evaluate the truth of these statements by looking at some evidence. But who decides what is evidence in the first place? Isn't that the big controversy these days? Well, it's an important question and we'll discuss it in a bit. For now, let's take a look at evaluative statements. Now, these are statements containing value judgments, and people who want to sell us, fool us, or otherwise mislead us just love to dress up evaluative statements to look like descriptive ones. For instance, make America great again, the means of production belongs to the workers, or even something as simple as your performance has stagnated this quarter compared to that of your colleagues. These all can seem like they're simply a statement of facts, but do you see how these statements are simply dressed up to make them look that way? Well, the reason for this is simple. If you perceive a statement as a mere fact rather than as a value judgment, you're more likely to accept it as true without questioning it, aren't you? To overcome this, always ask the following questions. Does the statement imply that one thing is good or better and another thing bad or worse? In each of these statements, we can easily see through the use of the word great in the phrase make America great again, the word belongs in the phrase the means of production belongs to the workers, and the words performance and stagnated in the phrase your performance has stagnated this quarter. Upon closer inspection, we can see that there's no apparent method we can use to actually prove these statements one way or another. For that, we would need what's called a value theory, or an actual system of analysis that deals with the truth values of statements like this. And I've made a strong case for a specific theory of value in my published academic work. But regardless, are you starting to see how important it is to tease apart these two types of statements when you hear them? And do you see how crucial this is for our ability to think and perceive clearly? Well, it's not enough to simply be able to tell these statements apart. We need to know how to accurately analyze each type of statement, and doing so will easily put us in the top 1% of thinkers. And that's where our next step comes in. Determine whether the statement is deductive or inductive. Now, there have been some famous criticisms of this distinction, but for the sake of this video, and so we don't go down a crazy rabbit hole here, it's practical and useful to think in these terms. Essentially, deductive statements are ones that we don't need any external or empirical evidence for in order to show they're true. For example, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is necessarily true, as is a statement such as if P then Q, therefore not P or Q. The power of these is that they have a 100% probability of being true, and just to put that in context, the law of gravity has a 99.9999 something percent probability of being true not 100%. So can you see just how powerful deductive statements are for helping you make an airtight argument or spot a bad one? For instance, let's say someone tells you, I worked 80 hours per week for two years building a business and therefore I became successful. If you understand deductive reasoning, you wouldn't then be fooled when they go on to tell you, so if you want to be successful, you need to work 80 hours per week for two years. In logic, this is a fallacy called affirming the consequent. And do you see how crucial it is for your decision-making ability to be able to instantly spot these kinds of statements and identify them not only as false, but as logically, necessarily false? 
Well, if you want to get better at this kind of reasoning, the book Critical Thinking, Logic, and Problem Solving by Big Rocks Thinking is a great place to start. And you can find the summarized version of this on short form, which you can check out at the link in the pinned comment below. So hopefully you now see why our ability to analyze deductive statements is so powerful. But let's now move to inductive statements, or if you recall, statements that involve claims about the world out there. Because these are powerful too, but in a different way. Remember how we discussed the fact that the law of gravity has a 99.999 something percent probability of being true? Well, how are we able to claim this in the first place? It's because of the mountain of evidence that has been collected in its favor. But you see, especially these days, the idea of evidence has become so politicized as if it's something subjective or debatable. So we have to understand at a deeper level how to collect evidence as this is one skill set that most people get wrong. And learning the correct way to collect evidence will make you truly independent and free. And that's exactly what we'll learn how to do in step three, collect objective evidence. In this step, we'll discuss three methods you can use on a daily basis to evaluate these kinds of inductive statements about the world, society, and even yourself. And once you learn these, you'll become someone nobody can fool. You see, a scientific law such as the law of gravity becomes a law only after being tested again and again through the scientific method. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means something called falsification, which is the first of the three methods we'll discuss. You see, most of us have the process of collecting evidence all wrong. When we hear someone make some claim, or even when we make claims about ourselves, such as, I don't have the ability necessary to perform well in this career, we often think that the next step we should take is to go out and find whatever facts we can that support that claim. But that's not what collecting evidence means. In fact, that's the exact opposite of what it means to collect evidence. Instead, that's called confirmation bias, and it's a great way to fall into bad decisions and totally screw up your life. Instead, if we wanted to use a more scientific approach to this inductive claim, we would treat the claim as what is called a null hypothesis. We would then test this hypothesis by trying to disprove it not by trying to prove it. In other words, we would actively try to find facts that show it's false. Going back to our original statement, I don't have the ability necessary to perform well in this career, well, that would be our null hypothesis. And from there, we would then brainstorm ways to disprove this null hypothesis. Maybe you could improve your ability through more study by working with some peers or a mentor, or maybe you can leverage resources or other people with the right skills to help you achieve your desired results in that career. This kind of approach is exactly how the law of gravity was established, and this is exactly how we should treat every inductive claim we hear, whether that's on social media, on the news, or the ones we tell ourselves. To test your own ability to collect evidence by using falsification, let's take a look at this question. Feel free to pause the video at this point, read the passage in full, and then try to eliminate answer choices here by looking back into the passage to find evidence that conflicts with whatever statement you're evaluating. Is there evidence to support your given answer choice? If not, eliminate it. By the end of this video, we'll discuss the right answer and why it's right, so stick around to the end. So falsification is powerful, but it isn't enough. Science uses, and we need, other principles to help us collect accurate and potentially life-changing information. And that's where our second method comes in, Occam's razor. The law of gravity can explain everything from why apples fall from trees, why planets are spherical instead of flat, and why it's so hard to get off the couch and go to the gym. Okay, it actually can't explain that. But sometimes we really want to believe things that probably are more the result of overthinking than actual reality. So for instance, let's say your coworker treated you poorly today. You find out that one of their loved ones was in a minor car accident that day, and it's likely that this event is contributing to their mood. But don't we still sometimes have that voice inside us that says, but did I also do something wrong? Am I at fault here? Am I a bad person? We get so deep in our heads that we overlook the simplest explanation we already discovered, namely that their loved one was in an accident. Haven't you ever done this? Well, just like in the case of the law of gravity, it certainly could be the case that every time an apple falls from the tree, it's because invisible magic elves are pulling it to the ground. But 
<laughs> Occam's razor dictates that if there is already an explanation for which there is sufficient evidence, we are obliged to accept that and that alone as the explanation. Are you starting to see how you could incorporate this principle into your daily life? Well, there's still one more inductive method that we can use to help us become better thinkers and decision makers than the vast majority of people. And that method is called Bayesian reasoning. Imagine someone tells you they're psychic. Okay, we can be open-minded, right? But how would we judge whether to believe them or not? I mean, this is something that, if true, is extremely rare and doesn't have a lot of existing evidence to support it. It's similar to UFOs, the Loch Ness Monster, or even a brand new technology that's never been tested before. And Bayesian reasoning works well for these types of situations. Because we don't know the probability of these kinds of rare events such as being psychic or alien visitation, or whether a new technology will work, we have to assume what's called a prior probability. A probability we're not sure of, but that we can assume is pretty low. So for instance, in the case of the psychic, we assume a skeptical position as the default. We assume they aren't psychic and that there's, let's say, only a tenth of a percentage chance that they actually are psychic. If they guess a highly specific personal detail about us that pretty much nobody would know, we then update the prior probability and admit that the probability they are psychic has slightly increased although it is still low. If they then go on to do this five, six, 10, 20, whatever times in a row, then that probability becomes higher and higher. And if that did happen, we could have a fair amount of confidence that we're talking to a genuine psychic. But how can we use this in our everyday lives? Well, we can use them in similar situations in which the event is rare and the probability is unknown, such as the probability that your romantic partner isn't a fit for you. We often irrationally ignore red flag after red flag, but do you see how, for instance, 20 times in a row of your partner insulting you might be a sign they don't genuinely love you? And we can use Bayesian reasoning in all sorts of situations like this, such as when a new miracle product comes on the market, a new national policy is introduced, or when starting a new business in an untested market. Ask yourself, what kind of repeated evidence would it take to show it's an idea worth pursuing? But it's also not enough to simply understand how to evaluate the logic or evidence for statements. And that's where our fourth step comes in determine whether the statement is denotative or connotative. Now, let's face it, a lot of the things we say can't actually be evaluated logically or with evidence. What do I mean by this? Well, let's consider our previous statements, make America great again, and the means of production belongs to the workers. As we discussed before, these are evaluative statements, statements that contain primarily value judgments and not judgments about something out there in physical reality. But in addition to a value judgment, they are also expressing some emotion. What emotion they are expressing is completely dependent on the speaker. As such, statements like these are what we call connotative. They elicit some sort of emotion and represent some sort of emotional need. When we ourselves have connotative thoughts such as, I'm just not good enough, we should first admit, this doesn't really mean anything literal. This first helps us stop BSing ourselves and helps us realize we're not thinking clearly, but instead are simply making stuff up. The next step is to then ask ourselves, what is the actual emotional meaning behind this? What am I trying to express to myself that I need here? When we immediately call BS on ourselves like this, we can more quickly address the emotional needs behind statements such as, I'm not good enough. For instance, do you really just mean you feel embarrassed or ashamed? Do you really just mean that you lack a certain skill and feel bad about it? Do you see how asking questions like this is at least 50% of the way towards solving the real problem? Any statement such as the earth is flat, I mean round, the earth is round guys, any statement like that is what we call denotative. It's purely literal, no emotional meaning behind it. And for that matter, many statements we make contain both connotation and denotation. Most of us simply don't even understand our own thoughts, ideas, and opinions because we haven't bothered to take the time to tease apart the denotative and connotative elements behind them. By the way, what was your answer to that multiple choice question? 
Well, A and C are hopefully clearly wrong, but B here is actually plausible. After all, it's plausible that the number of audits is so great that not even one could be completed on time. But then again, it's also plausible that vaccines cause autism or that everyone in your life is laughing at you. But is there actual evidence to support it? In other words, is that the most likely reason not one audit has been completed here? And so the answer is D here. You see, that's where many of us get stuck also, in failing to see the difference between an idea that's simply plausible versus an idea that has evidence to support it. Did you get D as your answer here? If not, don't worry. It takes time to build our critical thinking skills, but hopefully now that you've watched this video, you understand why doing so will absolutely change your life. If you want to keep leveling up your critical thinking to make a massive impact not only on your own life, but on the lives of countless others, then be sure to watch this next video.